What's a sign of childhood trauma? Interesting. Someone kept telling me to stop apologizing for everything and people around were agreeing as if it was annoying to them, which it probably is, and I understand that. And without even realizing I just said I'm sorry I just feel bad for existing in a room full of people I live with at uni. It was incredibly embarrassing. Always saying sorry, feeling guilty for speaking up. Scared of conflict to the point you avoid it at all costs, certain that if it happens the other person will hate you, it will end awfully. You've never seen people calmly sit down and discuss their emotions in a loving way, so that world doesn't exist. This is something I'm slowly realizing, and I'm slowly helping my friend realize. We've both grown up in broken households and are in similar situations where we see both of our parents, but we've seen so many conflicts that were handled in an unhealthy way. But we're basically siblings now, and with that comes conflicts, usually minor things. But I realized that I love her and therefore don't want to let disagreements pull us apart the way my dad has. I could go into more detail, but basically, moral of the story, it can get better, you can choose to handle your relationships different than your parents. My friend was once upset I drew on their window with my finger on the fog or whatever and I cried for 10 to 15 minutes and apologized profusely because I thought they'd leave me. That's the first time my friend group saw me cry. I didn't even mean to cry I was just kinda anxious then I started crying and couldn't breathe. It was honestly the craziest experience I didn't mean for it to happen at all. I was nearly 30 when I started telling people to off when they were tied to me. It literally took having a child and realizing I didn't want him growing up thinking it was okay to treat me like that. Every time conflict came up, I loved my caregiver enough or not to act right. Being angry, not doing what they wanted, meant I didn't care enough about them, and that made me a bad person. My emotional state was based entirely on stability, and 90% of that stability rested on me not making waves. So when my family members started dying and I realized how badly I had been treated. It was like a rebirth. I didn't have to put up with this. I didn't have to allow this to be around my child. I was allowed to be happy and not answer to anyone. I realized when I was sitting alone in my dad's funeral parlor that not one single member of his family gave about us. Not one. Not after all the weddings he had paid for, not after all the gifts he had given over the years. When I was able to shake the most important people in my life, I was able to thrive. Finding someone perfect for you and then systematically sabotaging it. Every time I get my together and actually have things going well, that little cocker hiding behind my nightmares pops his head up and just antagonizes me until I raise it all. I'm currently trying to work my way out of my fourth self-destruct sequence. As Detective Murdaugh would say, I'm getting too old for this. Too many times. Thankfully, I finally recognized what I was doing, albeit too late to save it and am now in therapy. Recognizing those patterns of sabotage are so important because you're going to be doing it. Instinctively and not on deliberately. Personally, every ounce of insecurity I ever had, about my body, about my money, about the opportunities I had, or what I can and can't enjoy, is amplified out with pinpoint accuracy at the other person, and often I was left soon after with confusion as to what we were even fighting about. Do this one too many times and it becomes abusive and it pushes people away and hurts them. I can only recommend getting therapy if you struggle with this because you can get better and you will save yourself and others a lot of hurt because in hell does it hurt. Unable to forgive themselves for small mistakes. Small mistakes were a sign of ignorance, of not caring. If I wasn't paying attention to every detail and I made the smallest mistakes, it would mean that I had to clean and fix it to the exact condition to what it used to be. Even now, my inner voice screams degrading insults whenever I screw up even the smallest thing. I cut my sandwich diagonally, and they weren't symmetrical so I felt uneasy eating it. I wept during every supervision session when I was a PAAAHDAAADDDDHEHE student, like, constant tears that I just couldn't stop. I had to tell my supervisors that I was intellectually fine with what they were telling me were everywhere because I never learned how to properly regulate them. When I finally stopped crying at every session, they knew it was time for me to defend 
My supervisors did more than help me learn how to be a researcher. I thought I was already past this, but then my former boss keep criticizing me on the smallest things. Sometimes it's not even my fault. All the healing that I did went to drain. I would freeze up when he's scolding me that I can't talk to defend myself. I got to the point that I want to jump in front of the train then talk to him about a certain project issue. My fiance and he used his commanding voice to me to look for another work. Been working in a new company for a month now but the trauma is still there. My new boss and co-workers are really nice but I still have that panic feeling whenever I can't finish something right away or if something went wrong with the project even though it's not my fault. Some of my co-workers are even teasing me to slow down because they can't keep up. It sounds like I'm really good at my job but I was panicking and needed to finish the task immediately. Having a hard time showing emotion. Wow, many people are replying to this, sorry in advance if I don't get around to reply to you specifically. Some of you have also mentioned the other extreme of this, a lot of emotion. Regardless, I hope everybody is doing better. I was actually talking to my oldest daughter about this. In our house, I'm regarded as the rock of the family. When my wife or kids are worried or stressed, I'm the constant that stays the course and keeps cool. We're going to be alright, I believe that too, but at the same time, I've taken to let it all out, to release it and have a good cry for a few minutes. But I'm unable to at this point. I grew up with a histrionic mother who resented anyone else getting attention. Or she'd make a problem about herself. Either way, it meant a scene. She'd either ridicule my crocodile tears or start shouting at my father yet again. I learned very early to keep my feelings to myself and show nothing outwardly. Ironically, when I got older, she resented this too. I was shutting her out. Turned out, shared griping was the only way she knew to bond. Hyper-independence can't be let down if you never ask for anything in the first place. For me, it's also knowing that family helping would always make the situation infinitely worse. Or conversely, even when you don't ask for their help, they just announce they won't help you. I've got some good friends, who I know aren't that way, but I still really struggle with this one. It's just so much easier to do it myself, and not be a burden. I have found that on the rare occasion I do ask friends for help, they usually jump at the chance, and they don't lord it over my later for control, or to make me feel bad. It's crazy. It's a big point of conflict between my boyfriend and I. I was neglected pretty severely growing up. It's led to a really bad combination of not knowing how to do anything, but also I refuse to let anyone help me do anything. My boyfriend is a saint though, he helps me and has so much patience. We literally just had another talk about me letting go of control a little bit because I let myself get overwhelmed. We have a ton of things going on right now with our house and cars and finances and I keep thinking I can do it but then I become too stressed to function well. He helps to reel me in when I start getting too scared to let go. The biggest hyper-independent struggle for me is I never had anyone there for me to actually emotionally support me so now that I do have people coming into my life wanting to be there for me, I see absolutely no point in going to them. I'm used to handling everything. Emotionally on my own journaling it, telling my spirit guides and angels about it, venting on videos and deleting them, never sending them. I don't feel like anything anyone else says can comfort me or there's no point in me telling someone. But also, the reactions I get from people when I do talk about my day or future goals for myself or plans is dismissive and cold. I've been around people who love me but they seem to not care when I'm talking about how my day was or what I'm excited for. So there's just no hold up. I still try and try to tell people what I've been up to or open up about my day, but I always get the same kind of reaction and feel like I might as well be invisible and immediately regret telling them. It's harder when it's family and they're just not hearing me. Choosing partners who don't support, cherish, or value you that reflect the lack of empathy and neglect that you grew up with. I was with my partner for seven years before I realized, accepted that he was in it for the long haul with me. I had some trauma, triggered, and it made me lash out at him, then promptly have a total breakdown. But instead of getting mad and telling me I was being ridiculous, instead of brushing off my feelings and just awkwardly waiting for me to pull myself together, he got down on the floor with me, hugged. 
me tight and said I'm here, and I'm not going anywhere. I'm on your side. I cried harder than I had since my childhood cat died when I was 12. No one in my life had ever stood with me like that. It broke something in me to hear those words, but it healed something too. Or started to, at least. It'll be June. My sister has a pattern when it comes to relationships. Always choosing someone who's already in love with some other girl and is using her as an option. She's having troubles with this one guy now who's living with his ex. She said that even if he breaks her heart 50 times and says he still wants to make it work with her, she will go back to him. Ugh. I wanted to tell her to have some self-respect but I just told her to get therapy like I've done a hundred times before. When I was younger looking back I had a lot of people interested in me, but I always assumed could love or care for me like that. I convinced myself that it was in my head or I just didn't see the signs at the time. I was a complete icicle on the outside, but inside was a total storm of self-hatred, loathing, and fear of not being good enough for anyone or anything. I isolated myself from everyone and everything including my family. That completely changed when I met my wife. It sounds completely corny as, but her personality was like melted me from my shell. Felt like I found my missing piece. We have been married for 15 years now. Oversharing when you haven't known the person long or the opposite where you don't open up to anybody, two extremes. I was literally talking to my technician about this yesterday, I'm a pharmacist. Within like three interactions with patients, just running them up and chatting a little at. The counter, she has patients all the time tell her about things like abuse or neglect or other things. She doesn't bring anything like that up, but patients just really want to talk to someone about it I guess. There's really not a lot though we can do directly, as number one my technician isn't licensed to give medical advice, and number two my training on cognitive care isn't as expansive as someone. Things like that come up we try to steer them in the right direction. But it's interesting how much people will share with only three one-minute interactions at the pharmacy counter. I've done both, overshared about an incident where I was 12. I was molested by a kid two years older than me for a year and I have overshared info to people I've been friends with for a month. Haven't told anyone in my family because at first I was afraid they'd be upset at me, but now, it's just because I don't want any of them to catch a murder charge. It also caused me to have a skewed outlook on and intimate contact. I either ask for it too much because I always thought it was the most intimate form of showing love, or I never did it because the previous relationship ended badly because I asked too much. It is a vicious cycle. Hypervigilance, sitting in my room, keep staring at the door expecting someone to barge in. Trying to exercise in the garage at night, expecting someone to whip open the door and say something like, WHAT are you doing? Driving in the car and keep checking my rear. View mirror to make sure that I'm not going to slow for the car behind me, imagining that they're judging me. Waiting in line at the grocery store and feeling nervous if someone decides to wait behind me. Hands shaking as I enter my card. Sitting in a college class, hyper aware of those around me. Walking down college campus my first year, legs feeling like jello because it feels like everybody is staring and making fun of me. And then those very few times in public when someone actually is judging me happen, I remember them. It like confirms my fears. Perfectionism addictions, compromised relationship to intimacy, their bodies, eating, money, the comp is a big one that can be hard to understand, especially people who have histrionic PD or BPD, using intimacy as a way to control and manipulate others for their own safety or validation. I hooked up with a woman once who I met sitting at a table full of strangers at a bar and saying she was an addict and she'd anyone, was pointing at everybody at the table and saying I'd you and you and you, later invited me to her place, then told me she wanted to take things slow and wasn't ready for anything physical. Then told me she wanted to hook up and asked me to do specific things. Then called my friends and accused me of pressuring her into it after the fact. Probably should have listened to my gut on that one. Childish activities become almost like treats. People can just enjoy watching things from their childhood or playing games or whatever independently from trauma, but it is incredibly common for the people with trauma to basically want to relive their childhood that they lost when they are in a safer environment. 
Just offering my personal experience here. When it's happening, it feels feels like is that the past 20 years of living have been a detour as I worked to back to the trajectory I felt I had as a kid before things hit the fan. So it kind of feels like now that I'm in a safer environment I went okay now where was I and picked up where I left off. And it's not even a conscious decision, just improvements through therapy just this week I was toying with a radio. When I realized the last time I even had an interest in electronics was a long time ago. My interests kind of naturally came back in the absence of survival instincts. I haven't had a close or best friend other than my wife since I was like 18 years old or so. I'm 52. It's too painful. I have lots of people I do love at work and a couple of people I am closer with than others but it's very difficult. I think I may have no idea how to have friends. Sounds ridiculous but maybe someone can relate to that. All I ever want is to retreat and be alone. At this point I'd close with someone but maybe I am getting closer to finding peace with myself over this. Tired of beating myself up. I am always scared that people are mad at me always. I'm 56, my mom was always upset with everyone but refused any responsibility for her actions. I received my first handwritten letter from her when I was 11. I came home from school one day and on my bed was a hand. Written, four-page letter about what a disappointment I was in virtually every regard, these letters appeared on my bed a few times a year then she mailed them to me until I was in my late 30s. When I told her I have given myself permission to throw throw them away because I won't allow you to abuse me anymore, she wrote you're a poor excuse for a sister, I'm disappointed in you as a daughter. After I got married the letter said your marriage is a sham, you are a terrible housekeeper, just wait until your husband leaves you. I'm 56, I've been very, happily and successfully married for 36 years with a husband who would directly behave, polite child who was a great student, had a spotlessly clean and tidy bedroom, taught Sunday school, volunteered at the YMCA, babysat and saved my money. Had my own apartment my senior year in high school, I worked 36 hours a week during my senior year in high school while paying all my own bills. Husband and I raised a wonderful young woman with a tremendous amount of love and support. Two husbands left my mother. And when she battled cancer for six years my two brothers never made a single appearance. I took care of her till the end. I'm glad I did as she finally realized what an successful I had been at my own life. I carry the lifelong trauma of a belittling mother who was always mad at everyone. They make no eye contact. I know because even at the age of 45 I will always struggle with thism. As a kid I started making eye contact on some occasions with my abusers as I got older and stronger and began standing up for myself. To me eye contact is about warning people off, showing aggression, and eventually fighting. It's only in my late 40s that I've realized I don't make eye contact with people including friends. When I try to it feels strange and I can't make eye contact easily with my baby daughter. When I remember and I do make eye contact, I think she notices and she gets happier. The only time I can properly and easily make eye contact with people is in an aggressive way. I only realized recently that hyper-independence is a result of childhood trauma. As a young adult, I was very proud that I am hyper-independent, but I later realized that. I only realized recently that hyper-independence is a result of childhood trauma. As a young adult, I was very proud that I am hyper-independent, but I later realized that it's not healthy and it stems from my fear of abandonment. I don't like to rely on people because I might get disappointed if they're unable to fulfill my needs. There's also a fear that they might think I that will cause them to leave me. So growing up, I've learned to be extremely independent. I tried to do everything on my own and rarely asked for help. This has made my college years incredibly difficult. I couldn't even join or make study groups because of fear of being judged that I'm not smart enough which would result to me being alone. An adult acting childlike. People think it's cringe but age regression is a trauma response. You can especially see this as you've ever been to a psych ward. People are clinging to blankets and stuffed animals. Childhood was probably the last time they existed without being traumatized. I work in a psychiatric behavioral health program and
My work said that was interesting is that sometimes when you see a kid lashing out or just uncontrollably sobbing, sometimes the way they emotionally respond doesn't look congruent to how they would self-regulate, react at their actual age level. She said that sometimes that could be a possible sign of childhood trauma because of stunted emotional growth. So take it or leave it, but it does make sense. Now I sometimes reflect on my own breakdowns because I damn sure do not cry as if I were 27 years old. Constant dark humor or self-deprecating humor. Also, the ability to totally pretend crappy things never happened or pretend someone didn't do something awful to you. People might think you're really funny and forgiving, but sometimes they are both just coping mechanisms. God, this is so ing true. Just the other day, my friend and I were opening up about our parents would do that was really quite abusive, locking me outside, not always letting me put my jacket on despite being in the middle of an Alaskan winter, and how it apparently has actually caused some nerve damage in my fingers. I couldn't stop laughing. None of that is funny, but I felt like if I didn't laugh then I would bring down the mood too much, or I would seem like I'm just talking about this for attention, which is ing ridiculous because we were literally talking about childhood trauma. Getting disproportionately frustrated, such as spilling things, accidentally breaking something, etc. What happens is, a lot of these people would be abused as a kid for these things, so as an adult when it happens, their brain overloads their system. With fear and anxiety and frustration can be secondary emotion to that. So when these things happen, this is basically a conditioned response because your brain associate these accidents with imminent danger. This is why therapy is so important for people who had childhoods especially during their developing years. I had no idea this was a thing until I went to therapy, but when my therapist explained this to me, it things happen, I tend to laugh it off. As a kid I was never allowed to make mistakes. Bad grade? Grounded until next report card. Dropped a glass? Berated for being sloppy and careless exact words. Lost something? Also sloppy and careless. I went through this my entire childhood and lived with my parents off and on. Through college. In my first two jobs after college I had managers that did the same thing, so I just assumed I was the up. I started my current job right at a year ago, and I found a mistake I had made a few months back. I went straight to my boss. It could potentially be a costly mistake. And his response? Thank you for letting me know, and thank you for tracking everything down for me. I kind of pushed, like to make sure he understood that I add up, and he says, yeah, it's okay. We're all human, and as your boss, it was my job to make sure you understood what was asked. I didn't, and you made an understandable mistake. And now you've done everything in your power to help fix it. I'm proud of you. I held it together for the remaining three hours of my shift but I burst into tears the second I got in the car to go home. I have never had someone treat me with such kindness and actually recognize that I didn't make that mistake on purpose. And he also recognized that I tried my hardest to make things easier for him and that I wanted to work together to fix things.